Good morning. How many of you are afraid of the dark and are willing to admit it? How many of you maybe remember a time when you were scared of the dark? When you were younger, maybe? What is it about the dark that makes us scared? Even if you tell me right now that you're not afraid because no hands really went up in the air like you were really afraid of the dark, if we put you out in the middle of a forest on a dark, cloudy night, you're probably going to get a little nervous. You're probably going to have some concerns, you know, those, the unknown, the noises that you just can't place and you don't know where they're coming from, the shadows that you are sure are moving towards you, that feeling that you're being watched, that you're being followed, that tingling on the back of your neck. But leave it to God to take something that's frightening, something dark, and adorn it. If you go out away from the city and you look up and you see the starry sky, you, you can, maybe you can see the, the picture on the background there, just the beauty of the stars. And God takes something that we might be afraid of, a dark night, and he lights it up for us. Even when we're scared or unsure, we don't know what's going on, God can adorn that. If you remember last week, the last verse we talked about was, Therefore I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands, without wrath or dissension. I sort of gender neutralized that to say we all need to be in prayer. And this week, I especially want the men to be in prayer, obeying that verse. Guys, be praying, lifting up holy hands, because if you've looked ahead at this week's passage, you'll know why us guys need some more prayer this week. This week, our passage is one of much debate and can get a little intense. At a passing skim through, we see that Women should be dressed modestly and do good works around the house, of course. They should be quiet and submissive. Our passage seems to indicate that all women are good for is staying at home quietly, birthing the children, taking care of us men, and anything we do wrong is probably their fault. <laughs> We're going to look more closely at that. Guys, as I said, be praying, and if you need to move a couple seats away for a little while, go ahead and do that. But first, let's pray and let's read the passage. God, I pray you be with us today. Lord, help us to look at this, this letter that was passed down. Help us to see the insights that Paul intended for Timothy and that you intended to pass down through the generations. God, I pray that we would look at this and see what you want us to see, Lord. I thank you for passing this letter down through the years so we could have it. And I pray you be with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for a woman making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Let's break this down. Verse 9 and 10 speak about modesty. And first of all, let's notice this verse, how it starts. He says, I want. I want women, too. On and on and on. This letter is from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, to Timothy, an up-and-coming preacher of this church that Paul helped get started. Paul is writing that to help Timothy, this young leader, with all the stress and responsibility comes, that comes with being a church leader, being a young church leader at that. There's a lot of cultural connection with what Paul was saying. Various cults that were going on in the communities that dressed certain ways and had certain braids and certain garments and certain fancy things. There were temples around to the false gods. There was a correlation between the clothing and, and the braids and these temples. Your, your personal decor could represent something that you didn't want to represent. There were, in that time, a lot of temple prostitution going on. Instead of working to ordain their outside and possibly be misconstrued or connected with something they didn't want to be connected with, these cults and the temple prostitutes, or to catch someone's eye for all the wrong reasons, the focus that Paul is pushing and encouraging Timothy to push and encourage the people at his church is on service. What Paul is pushing is 
to do, be doing good works. And that is how we should adorn ourselves. We should do the good works so that our spirit, that we, we follow God, our insides match our outsides. Now, instead of working to adorn the outside, we work to adorn our inside. I will say that we probably all, when we get dressed up nice, we feel good. You put on your nice clothes to go out to a show or out to dinner, and you feel nice. You know, when I, when I get really dressed up and I comb my hair real nice, I feel, like, I feel like James Bond sometimes. But we have to be careful how we are perceived. How is the outside adornment being seen by others around us? I may think of myself as James Bond, the suave, smooth, super spy with the cool gadgets and the nice car, not a Ford Taurus. But others, the other side of that coin, people may see James Bond and all they think of is the ladies' man, the killer. And there are some nuances that go along with James Bond that I don't want to be affiliated with. I, like Paul, want women to dress modestly. But more than that, I desire for all of us in all aspects of our life to represent Christ through our actions and through our service. I put jokes in this week's sermon very intentionally and highlighted them with yellow so that I could kind of lighten things up a little bit. So here's joke number one. A burglar breaks into a house. He's being all quiet and sneaky and ninja-like and looking for valuables. And he hears a voice that says, Jesus is watching. He freezes and, and looks around and doesn't see anybody. Then he hears it again. Jesus is watching. And he says, who's there? And over in the corner, a birdcage, the bird replies, Moses. <laughs> the man says, what kind of person names their bird Moses? And the bird replies, the kind of person who names their Rottweiler Jesus. <laughs> Verse 11, no one's getting hit right now, so we're in good shape. It worked. Verse 11 and 12 talk about women being submissive. See how I set you up now? You're in a good mood. It says, ladies are to receive instruction quietly and with entire submissiveness. When we see this, we have a tendency to focus on that bit about submission, and we spin that to keep the men in the lead role. We spin that to put women in the corner. The very next verse, Paul writes that he does not allow a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. In our present day culture, this seems a bit barbaric. Women are equals in our world today, right? However, if you were to look even a little bit into our past, reading this passage wouldn't have been a big deal at all. Of course the woman is submissive to her husband. Of course the woman obeys her husband and follows that. The attitude of quietness that he mentions in verses 11 and 12 rules out teaching, and the attitude of submissiveness rules out exercising authority. That can strike us as off. But if we look back a few years, it's not so bad. And if we look back even farther, it's even less bad. This isn't a surprise or a debated topic to the people the letter was first written to, because Jews and Greeks didn't permit women to teach. It wasn't a shock at all. Interesting to note, the same attitude of quiet and submissiveness that Paul's talking about here for women is also expected of the young men who are training under the rabbis. Quiet and submissive, they will learn. But then they then go out and are the authorities. This quiet and this submission that Paul talks about are concerning the learning environment only, not life in general. Paul is teaching Timothy what Paul does in order to help Timothy as he works to lead the church. Women teachers weren't a thing in their societies. Allowing women to teach would have been counterproductive for the church because that was so against the norm that would have turned people off very strictly to Christianity. I want to make a note of the stress here in verse 11. If we look at verse 11, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. The focus isn't on quiet and submissiveness. The focus is on the woman must receive instruction. The focus of that statement is receive instruction. I don't even have to gender neutralize that. As we sit here today, we can all see that we all need to be receiving instruction in the scripture. We all stand to gain some insights into the scriptures. I'm not going to assign a gender to anyone. I think that's already been done. Men and women are born as either men or women. Men and women are different. Generally speaking, men are stronger than women, and that's not so the men can enslave the women, so the men can protect the women. Amy is mine just as much as I 
am hers. She feels safe when I'm with her, just like the kids. When they're scared at night, they don't go running to Amy. They come to me, partly because she doesn't wake up at night. <laughs> when Amy can't open something and she needs a strong man, she comes to me, and I'll either get it open or I'll break it. I feel better when Amy is by my side, and she feels better when I am by hers. God created women to be a partner, to be a helper. God made Eve from Adam so that they could be one. That was interesting. As I looked through Genesis, God took a piece of Adam out to make Eve so that they could be one. Our passage today has so much current application, even if our society is different. I'm not going to give you a cop-out and say this was just society there, and that's the only reason he says this, that certain bits that I choose don't apply today, but everything else that I say does apply, does apply. We mustn't interpret, misinterpret, however, passages like this and think that the men should make the women sit in the corner and stay home and do the cooking and cleaning, all while remaining silent about all matters. That is not even the case for the well-respected Proverbs 31 wife. Have you heard of her? Let's take a look at what Proverbs says. Now, this was Solomon. He was pretty wise, and let's see what he wrote, and if he wrote that the woman should stay at home and do nothing. This is in Proverbs 31. An excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar, she rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions it to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor and she stretches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates where he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Let her works praise her in the gates. It's the same focus that Solomon gives, that, that kind of model of a wife that, that is, seems unattainable, that same focus on works as what Paul is mentioning here. Culture is not the control of how we interpret and live the scriptures, but it is the target of how we do so. A man came to the pastor after church, and he said, could you say a prayer for my hearing? So the, the pastor, of course, a godly man, reaches up, puts his hands on the man's ears and says a prayer. And after he says amen, after a few minutes, several minutes of a, a good, good healing prayer for the man's hearing, he takes his hands off and says, how's your hearing? I don't know. It's not till Tuesday. <laughs> the next section talks about giving birth. See, I had to butter you up again for this one. Women will be preserved through the bearing of children. Childbearing, that's something I can't argue with. Women bear children. Men don't. However, the attitude that we sometimes get is that all women are good for is bearing children. Stick them at home in the kitchen, make me a sandwich, clean it up, pop out the babies. That feels cheap to me. There's a lot more to that. Just watching the things that Amy does and has to put up with and hearing the phone calls that I get of children screaming I, I'm probably the only one who gets those phone calls. There's so much more that goes on at home. We don't want to minimize the women's value. Even if at home is where the husband and wife decide is best for their family, for the wife to stay while he goes out and, and, and earns the living while she takes care of the kids and raises them upright, even if that's what they decide, there's so much more. At some point, every single one of us in here relied on a woman, at least for a little bit. 
we don't want to minimize the woman's value. And we don't want to be perceived as minimizing the woman's value because people are watching us. Let's look at a few women in scripture. Esther, she was a queen and she highly served her people. She saved them because of her boldness and not sitting quietly in a corner. Priscilla was a friend of Paul's from Ephesus who also along with her husband helped train up Apollos who went on to spread the gospel further than they would have been able to. Eve was placed to help do work with Adam and be the perfect partner. Anna was a prophetess mentioned in Luke chapter 2, who after her husband passed away, she never left the temple, serving, praying, fasting. Dorcas in Acts 9 was a disciple who was known for her kindness and all that she continually did for others, known for her service. Lydia in Acts 16 was a leader of the church. She was a wealthy lady who opened up her home and her wealth so that people could meet, and she supported the missions of Paul and Silas as they went out and spread the gospel. Philip's daughters were prophetesses. Nympha was spoken of in Colossians 4, another wealthy lady who opened up her home and allowed the church to gather there. David's wife, Abigail, was wise and discerning. She helped David make good choices. Elizabeth, Zachariah's wife, ministered to Mary in Luke 1 when she needed it. Peter's wife was unnamed, but she served Jesus and the guys. In Mark chapter 1, Susanna and Joanna, Luke 8, are among others who helped serve Jesus and the guys. We're all called to do something. These women, they probably did a great job at raising their children, managing their household, and whatever else they were called to do that was culturally acceptable for women to do in that day. But look at what else they did. Look at what else these women are known for, and they might not have thought they were doing much. But here we are all these years later, and we're still looking at their example. Their insides match their outsides. They adorned themselves with service, and that's the legacy that they left. It would be unfortunate if our debate about women's roles prevents us from seeing the broad teaching of this passage about prayer and modesty and good deeds and the command for women to learn the moral qualities described in verse 15. We can debate different situations where different things will and won't work. In an ideal world, God would still be wandering around with Adam and Eve in the garden. We work with what we've got, and what we've got is the gospel. What we've got is knowing that we are adorned with God's love. And the goal of this, the lesson, the application from this, is that women and men, and I'm back to gender neutralizing things, we need to have insides that match our outsides. And our outsides need to match our insides. And that is the legacy that we leave for our children, for our church. We are adorned with this wondrous love of Jesus and it needs to show. It is our public behavior rather than our private worship that is seen by people we are called to bring into an understanding of the gospel. Verse 12, when Paul says, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet is not a command. This letter is Paul teaching Timothy his thoughts, his lessons learned as, lead, as a leader of the church, as directed by his life as an apostle. This letter helps us with these valuable lessons. This letter to Timothy reflects a very serious concern that Paul had about the transmission and protection of this apostolic gospel that was handed down to these few men and is now spread across the globe. Paul writes this letter to Timothy as he leads the church. Paul's hope and prayer is that Timothy will stand firm and not get shipwrecked in his faith. This is the legacy that's passed down to us. Paul wants Timothy's outward to match his inward. And he wants Timothy's inward to match his outward. God wants our outward to match our inward, and he wants our inward to match our outward. What if instead of focusing on modesty, submissiveness, and birthing in this passage, what if we focus on adorning yourself, receiving instruction, and continuing in faith and in love? What if we change our focus from what normally is seen there, those harsh words that come out, and we look at, what the real focus is here. The world is scary. The dark night is scary, but God has adorned that. We can look up and see that. Things in our world aren't necessarily as God intended them to be. But when the sky is adorned by God, wow. You were adorned with beauty and with love. Don't be afraid of the culture, no matter how dark and scary it might seem. Don't worry about the world's expectations. Adorn yourself with good works. 
receive instruction in the scripture and continue in faith and in love. Let the way God has adorned you be your focus. Let your outward match your inward and let your inward match your outward and leave an inside out legacy. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the legacy that was left in scripture by, by the men and women that we have recorded here, God. Especially today for that list of women and, and others that we went over, God, that we can see the work that they did and how they adorned themselves with service for you and for others who are serving you, God. And I pray that we would see that example and that it would help us as we go out into the world, God, that it would help us to know that we can adorn ourselves and let our insides match our outsides, God. I pray that you would help us to seek you in your word, help us to seek you in prayer, God, and just help us to leave an inside-out legacy, Lord. Be with us today as we go from here. Thank you for Jesus, and it's in his precious name I pray. Amen.